know, edible kind of thing. You know, I can also believe a little bit in psychoanalysis. After all, the family is the first place where you become socialized. So as a socialization site, is as important as school and as important as your job later on, or more, because you're a little baby at the time. And so clearly you form certain ideas and certain categories about your parents that may be become disrupted if you see them uh, having sex, right? My only problem with that is to think, well, you know, when Freud came up with the Oedipus Complex, he was studying Austrian women and men from the late 19th century, where, you know, the nuclear family was already a, 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 a norm and was routine, but it's, it's supposedly the Oedipus Complex is supposed, is supposed to be something you inherit, it's like a, a reflex almost, it's, a, it's something that is almost genetic. And if it's genetic, then it must have been developed during those hundreds of thousands of years where we were hunter-gatherers. Now, hunter-gatherers don't have nuclear families. They have extended families. A baby passes from the actual real mother to another that serves as a, as a helper, to another that may be a, 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 an aunt or the grandmother. And when you have like six or seven mothers, and you find one of the mothers making love with one of the fathers, you don't totally freak out because it's not your mother of your nuclear family. So my question is, to what extent is Lacan and Freud influenced by having studied late 20th century examples of European families and not having ever done any psychoanalysis of hunter-gatherers? Because if the Oedipus complex is inherited, that is, if it's a reflex, something, something that we already come with as babies that you don't need to understand, then it must have been developed evolutionarily. And we spend the majority of time doing hunter-gathering. So I'm answering to your question, yes and no. Yes, categories are still important for Hume. And, uh, a, and, and certainly symbols have a certain, a certain way of organizing your thought in addition to intensities and routine and habit. The question is, again, what comes first? Since the baby doesn't learn how to talk until he's like, a year old or a year and a half and so on, but prior to that he already will learn how to walk and certainly how to grasp and how to play with things. I would say that bodily action comes first and then comes language. And so the two coexist, but one cannot be reduced to the other. And then, so um, what's the Kantian philosophers of today, what's their response to this? I mean, because, you know, you, that sounds logical, you know, um. Well, first of all, because they are the winners, they won the 20th century, they don't even think they have to have an answer. When, most, when you ask most of them about this thing, they look at you like you're the loser. You know, but, you know, you mean the loser of the 20th century is asking me, the winner of the 20th century, about how this went on? They don't even know that there's an alternative, the majority of them. They don't even know that, there's, that this is an alternative. They think that this is so well established and so widely believed by every philosopher, which is true, that you can take it for granted. You can take it for granted. Now, this, of course, leads also leads you away from materialism. This is one of the reasons why we have to have this class today. And I'll tell you why. The thesis by the way, the, the Neo-Kantian thesis is called the thesis of the linguisticality of experience. So let's refer to it that way. Experience is a structure by language. It's a structure conceptually is the linguisticality of experience. Now, when you believe in the linguisticality of experience, and you also understand that different cultures have different words, then you believe that different cultures live literally in different worlds. Meaning, there is no objective world in which we all live. The only world that exists is the world of experience as a structure by concepts, and, that's, and that world is culture-bound. If you move to another culture, you want to study them, you first have to become one of them, learn their language, and then you learn to see the way they see. And now you can talk to those guys. Otherwise, you live in a separate world. And if every culture lives in a separate world, then there is no common objective world that we all live in. Right? The human doesn't have that problem. The human can accept that 
different cultures have different needs and therefore have different skills. And so, for instance, a tribal culture in Africa knows a lot, you know, the people there know a lot more about plants and can tell you the different types of plants, know a lot more about the tracks that, let, that animals leave, and therefore can tell you, look, there were two lions here last night because the, 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 the footprints are a little shallow, but this one's a little heavier, this was a heavier, you know, they can, they can read more about those, those, those intensities because they have other skills, and therefore they, they, uh, they know more about you about their world, but that doesn't mean that they inhabit an entirely different world than yours. You are also looking at those, at those tracks and you know that they are tracks and you know that they are plants and so on. This leads you to, a, to a, an absolute relativism in which the objective world disappears and all that exists is subjective worlds created by different languages. This one tells you we all share intensities. The tribal culture in Africa that I was telling you before that has only two words for color, it would be a mistake to think that they, they, they see in black and white. It's, it, is, it is important to believe that they also see in color like we do. They just don't have any need for color terms. So, if you're a materialist, unfortunately, you don't really have a choice between the two. If you're a materialist and you believe in the objectivity of the world, you almost instinctively need to side with him. I feel like Hume is, is focused on experience and Kant is on his descriptions of experience. Um, but that people learn in, in different ways. So you could be a human who describes your world, you know, using the Con Kantian vocabulary, but there's also a whole other slew of people that you know don't use that the perhaps are more kinesthetic in the way that they perceive and communicate things or more auditory, you know, so with the, the Hopi people or whoever in Africa, you know, I think what the, the issue seems to be for, for me is that they, they isolate it as if we are all visual learners. You know, we're all written visual learners, which is not true in any means. And right, particularly in, in tribes that don't have a written language, right? It's right. Not only an oral language. Yeah, no, I agree with you. But that is why I introduced this distinction here. This distinction is about knowing and teaching. Remember, knowing that is taught by giving you information, by telling you the sentences. Knowing how is taught by example and by practice. Teaching involves both. And I do, and, and I do agree with you that different cultures would place different emphasis on different ones. In many schools in our culture, in Western culture, they simply, what are they, in schools that emphasize rote learning, they just give you sentences, and you need to memorize them. You know, tell me the capital of Iowa. You know, capital of Iowa is, I don't know, I don't even know what the capital of Iowa is. You know, but they, for, <laughs> they force you to memorize a bunch of facts, and that they call learning. I don't call that learning. Call that rot memorization, you know. So if you balance these two, you get a more balanced sense of what learning is. Other schools may emphasize too much finger painting and, 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 and free action and so on, and not, and not give you any facts with language. That may also be deficient as a, as a form of pedagogy. You might need both in different proportions depending on the different subjects. So, so you have a good point there. Yes. Um. Is it Heisenberg or the, the Adam, like the book Observing the Adam Changes It? How does, how does that... Oh, he was completely wrong, of course. Well, he, what, how does he was it, completely wrong because that means that physicists are psychics, right? You know, they have psychokinetic. I'm observing the atom, man. <laughs> and with my mind, <laughs> I'm changing the atom. I'm shooting the electron, what, what, the electron but, but, Yeah, but uh, what he meant, really, and, you know, the, the, the idea that observing the atom changes the atom. Well, it was floated in the 1940s by a guy called von Neumann, and it was kind of passed around among physicists for a while, but if you ask any physicist today, any seasoned physicist, he will, he will say, no, that, it, that didn't turn out to be true. What they meant, or the, the, the objective content of the uncertainty principle, is this. Atoms are so tiny, 